Thank you so much, chairpersons. And uh, we know that uh, kidney disease is as important as heart disease. And uh, for a long time, nephrologists did not have many compounds. And SGLT2 inhibitors came in. And now SGLT2 inhibitors have become um, standard of care in nephrology. But there has been one molecule which is a disruptor molecule. It's a game changer molecule. And every year, you see a couple of papers in the highest impact journal on planet Earth, NEGM, from this finirizone stable. Even last week, and last to last week, in the New England Journal of Medicine, you saw some data which was presented at Madrid in FA, uh, ESD. So obviously, cardiorenal protection uh, has been the standard of care. And we know that kidney disease and heart disease are closely linked for acute and chronic and uh, the organ dysfunction, organ damage uh, is very vulnerable. And we know that our elderly people with chronic kidney disease are more likely to die of heart disease than even advanced uh, to uh, you know end-stage renal disease or dialysis. So can we actually save people from dialysis and end-stage renal disease? Can we really address kidney and heart systems together as one? And as I told you that for CKD, there was not many therapies in the last 40 years. Originally, they said blood pressure control, tighter the blood pressure control, the better it is. Then they said glucose control, tighter the glucose control, the better it is. And then came a very cutting edge study from Bronwald's group, which was the Captopril trial in 1993, just at the time of the DCCT trial. And uh, then came the ARBs, the INDT trial, the renal trial. And then for a 20 years, there was a gap in CKD specific therapy. And then we had large trials, the Credence trial, which was prematurely terminated, DAPA CKD trial prematurely terminated, and the EMPA kidney trial, which is also prematurely conducted on the HGL2 inhibitor. Suddenly we had explosion of drugs. But the two trials which took the nephrology by storm, because they have a different mechanism of action, are the non steroidal mineral corticoid receptor antagonists. The Fideligo DKD trial and the Figaro DKD trial. 2020-2021, just around COVID time. So let's look at a case. Mr. Raj, 57-year-old man, type 2 diabetic, who visits your clinic for a routine checkup. His A1C blood pressure is relatively well controlled. You know, he was diagnosed type 2 diabetes 10 years ago. 7.4 A1C, blood pressure 138 over 84. And Raj is one of those... 101 million people across India with type 2 diabetes. In India, you know, we know that almost 35 million adults had CKD and type 2 diabetes in 2017. So almost half that population. So he could be one of those 35 million or 50 million people with CKD and type 2 diabetes from the Indian population. But we have to focus on his kidney health because everything looks normal. And before we know the kidney health is spoiled. Duration of diabetes, 10 years, A1C, 7.4, blood pressure not well controlled, 130 over 84, BMI 28, baseline eGFR, now people do, you know, app it and do it, 64, potassium 4.7, positive history of hypertension and peripheral artery disease. So there is a risk, a renal risk. Looking at the eGFR, it looks like it's a low risk. For diabetes, glimoparide, 2 milligram, metformin, 500, DAPA, Tell me certain carvedilol and thyroxin. But we need to do a USCR to get the complete picture. So clearly, you know, with EGFR of 64, the risk profiling will be, you know, around, say, G2. The CV profile is hypertension and CAD. But unless and until we do albuminuria estimation, we will miss the bus. And that's something which we need to recognize. Because Raj's UACR is 352, and it's a high risk. And that's what many of us as physicians were missing in the past. And I think we are happy that a lot of pharmaceutical mediated education occurred in that direction. And nevertheless, based on Raj's EGFR and UACR, we are now looking at guideline recommended care. And at least twice a year, you should do an USCR. So USCR is important because, you know, if you diagnose late, CKD progression is late, the entire burden will be for dialysis. Because if you have CKD diagnosed late, 
there will be twice as more fold of myocardial infarction cases, five fold increase in heart failure cases, you know, three to six fold increase in heart failure hospitalizations, and three times more cardiovascular deaths. And therefore, whenever there is a moderate to severely increased albuminuria versus normal albuminuria, because remember, albuminuria is kidney is hypertension, it is glomerular hypertension, it is equal to glomerular hypertension, and you may have been normotensive, but you may have albuminuria, you know, your likelihood of hitting an emergency room is 2 to 4 percent more, inpatient admissions 4 to 10 percent, receiving dialysis goes up almost 4 to 40 fold. So we need to reduce the downstream cardiorenal risk, and we need to hit hard hit early. We also know that albuminuria is a very simple but important early indicator both of heart and kidney disease outcomes. If you look at the composite CV outcome, you can see here the various shades of green and blue and you can very see clearly see if the USCR is low, the CV composite outcome or the kidney com composite outcome which is the first doubling of serum creatinine in, in stage kidney disease or death is much less compared to the higher risk of ratio. So very clearly you can see the graph separation occurs very early. And CKD unfortunately is grossly underdiagnosed. Tomorrow is the World Heart Day. Heart attack awareness is very high, but CKD awareness is very poor. Even in, 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 in physician community. And I think we need to ensure, because 85% of people have an EGFR assessed but only 47% of them had a UCSR uh, assessed. And fibrosis and albuminuria are the best prognostic markers or biomarkers for kidney failure. So EGFR may look normal, but it is the leaking albumin which merits attention, merits focus. And therefore, if you have a composite of both EGFR and USCR, at least once a year in every patient with type 2 diabetic, and if you get the ADA, the ACE, the KIDCO, all of them say that do both EGFR and USCR. So my first take home message is, as clinicians, it is mandatory to do EGFR and USCR in every person living with diabetes, at least once a year, because you can pick that renal risk early and you can, we need to support a more routine use of EGFR and albuminuria because it will also pick up the early CVD risk. And the ADA 23 last year itself said that if you reduce very high albuminuria levels, it will slow the CKD progression by 30%. So a person with CKD who has an albumin which is more than 300 milligram per gram, there'll be a 30% reduction and that will slow CKD progression. And the level of evidence is B, so it's a very high level of evidence there. So how should we take off people like patient like Araj? What should we do? What do the guidelines say? Well, all the societies, whether it's the European Society of Hypertension or Cardiology, the ADA KIDCO consensus, the ERA, ERB, the ADA or the KIDCO, they say RAS. Then we have non-steroidal mineral corticoid receptor agents and HGL2 inhibitors. So there's a three pillar therapy with Combined glucose control, blood pressure control, lipid control, smoking cessation or tobacco cessation, nutrition and exercise. So lifestyle is mandatory. De-addiction from smoke and tobacco is mandatory. The ABC, A1C, blood pressure and LDL is mandatory. But RAS or ARB, MSRA or finronone and HGL2 inhibitors are right there in the equation. So what is finronone and how is it different from the steroidal MRIs? So we know when the heart and kidney disease progresses in a type 2 diabetic, there is increased intraglomerular hypertension or hypertension. That is a hemodynamic factor. When the glucose control is poor, it is a metabolic issue. And then we have inflammation and fibrosis. So whether it is cardiac fibrosis or kidney fibrosis, what happens in the kidney? There is tubular interstitial damage and inflammation, glomerulosclerosis, mesangial expansion, and glomerular hypertrophy. And that leads to CKD progression. What happens to the heart? 
there is myocardial fibrosis, atherosclerosis, vascular stiffness, calcification, ventricular hypertrophy. And fundamentally what happens is that there is a lot of mineralocorticoid receptor overactivation. And this overactive mineralocorticoid receptor activation contributes to CKD progression that leads to hypertension or glomerular hypertension and albuminuria that leads to inflammation and fibrosis. And therefore, if we have an agent which blocks it, we can make a difference. So this is the first agent on planet Earth which blocks inflammation and fibrosis. Because whenever there is mineralocorticoid receptor overactivation, we all know that the aldosterone, which is a breakthrough in patients with CKD, with ACE and ARB, is increased. The cortisol is increased due to the ligand-dependent mineralocorticoid activation. The oxidative stress is increased due to the activation of the receptor. And due to the activation of the receptor, albumin leak or a high albumin is also seen. So clearly, neither RAS or ARB nor HGL2 inhibitors address the aldosterone, cortisol, oxidative stress, or albumin. So we have an agent called finronone now, which blocks this receptor and not only targets hemodynamic factors and metabolic factors, but targets inflammation and fibrosis. So it is different from a spironolactone or epiranone because we know that structurally both spironolactone and epiranone are steroidal and flat, while finronone is bulky and non-steroidal. It has very high potency against and selectivity against the mineralocorticoid receptor. So the selectivity is very high and it has a very short half-life. And no metabolites which are left over, lower rate of hyperkalemia and other adverse events like gynecomastia. So though spironolactone is still used in congestive heart failure and resistant hypertension, and so is aplerone, which is used in people who have a low ejection fraction heart failure, particularly below 40 and 30 percent and resistant hypertension, finronone is one agent which impacts the CKD progression with type 2 diabetes. But we are in an evidence-based uh, era and we need to go by evidence. So is there evidence for this mechanism of action and its effectiveness? And the phase two and the phase three programs for finronone, the ARDS study, the ARDS DN study, the ARDS heart failure study showed there was less hyperkalemia head to head with spironolactone, dose dependent reduction of albinuria and comparable safety with epiranone. So they have direct comparisons head to head. And the Fideligo DKD and the Figaro DKD study showed that it reduced kidney failure and disease progression on the kidney as well as on cardiovascular mortality and morbidity. So again, the data is far more compelling than even the HL2 inhibitors. So if you look at the evidence documented on the complementary kidney and cardiovascular endpoints on both the composites, heart and kidney, the data is very, very overwhelming. And you can clearly see that this data is very, very compelling. So clearly, finronone programs have shown that you can use it in a late stage CKD, in early stage CKD. So we have trials which are Figaro, early stage CKD, Fidelo, late stage CKD, and the Fidelity, which is from across all stages. So I think we have now one agent, which is a universal agent, which has documentation in the entire kidney space, which is universal. Worldwide, if it is affordable and accessible, it will virtually replace the entire RAS blockade, ARB blockade pathway. And it is the fidelity include, as I told you, type 2 diabetic people across CKD severity, which were treated with maximal tolerated doses of RAS. So you can clearly see her. And the fidelity showed a statistically significant reduction in kidney composite outcome by 23% end-stage kidney disease by 20%, the cardiovascular mortality and morbidity by 14%, and heart failure hospitalization risk by 22%. So data is very clear-cut. And even if you see the overall all-cause and cardiovascular mortality, 
risk for sudden cardiac death clearly you can see fingerprint showed evidence so whether it is cardiovascular or heart failure outcomes 22% reduced risk for first half hospitalization for heart failure in fidelity and the figaro dkd showed a 32% risk reduction of new onset heart failure and therefore the european society for cardiology said for prevention of heart failure fingerprint has been recommended with class 1a indication so it has a very high class of recommendation it reduced the uscr by 342% it clearly showed that in the fidelity the benefits which are kidney and cv of fingerprint were consistent independent of the hgl inhibitor use so clearly you can see the combined data is keeping people free from the end stage kidney disease survival and the incidence of hyperkalemia so though the potassium did show a increase was clinically the impact was insignificant so if you see that if there's a robust potassium vigilance this was there so what that what did fingerprint show it showed consistent heart and kidney benefits in every sub population independent of hglt2 or glp1 receptor that's number 1 irrespective of atherosclerotic cardiovascular history regardless of the a1c insulin use a1c variability or diabetes duration across stage 1 2 3 4 ckd irrespective of age sex and obesity and irrespective of the baseline blood pressure so i call it a universal agent which can make an impact on your heart and kidney both so for raj's health how should we use fingerprint because if you see the every guideline on planet earth 2022 ada level a recommendation guideline update again updated the label as guidance ada kidco guidance the every guideline on planet earth now has a level a 1a recommendation for the agent so how do we start it start with fingerprint if the potassium is less than 5 10 mg od if the egfr is between 25 to 40 60 if the egfr is more than 60 you can start with 20 monitor potassium in first month fourth month and every four month intervals adjust the dose if the potassium is less than 4.8 increase it to 20 mg and keep monitoring the potassium if the potassium is less than 5.5 you can use 10 or 20 mg and if the potassium goes up temporarily stop fingerprint and restart fingerprint with 10 mg again so it's very easy to use the 10 and 20 mg of fingerprint so raj has returned for his follow up let's assess his current status his a1c is 7 egfr is 65 uscr is 154 potassium is 4.6 so 20 mg of fingerprint is continued so there is a clear cut drop in the uscr from 352 to 154 or 56% reduction the egfr is same and potassium is constant so clearly you can see that the raj's risks for ckd progression after initiation of fingerprint shows a positive movement from a high risk to a moderate risk with over a 50% reduction in uscr in the third month itself so you can actually change the risk equation as i told you we were in madrid and at madrid at the esd we had more data published in new england journal of medicine in september of this month which investigated role of fingerprint in care of patients with heart failure so the fine hearts heart failure study was published and presented there and again these study results were very compelling we always thought that the only agent which is impacting heart failure after diuretics and other agents is hgl2 inhibitors no fingerprint has clear cut data now in the heart failure space which is compelling because not only impacts the primary endpoints with an 18% meaningful re uh, reduction of relative risk but also on cardiovascular death total heart failure events and even on the overall risk profile so if you look at the pre specified analysis of the fine heart heart failure trial 
independent of glycemic status or new onset diabetes presented at the ESD, you can see that people with history of diabetes had a significantly increased risk of CV death and total heart failure events versus people who are pre-diabetes with normal glycemia. And finrenone reduced the risk for CV death and total heart failure events versus placebo regardless of the history of diabetes and baseline status. So whether you are a diabetic or non-diabetic, it made a difference on heart failure just like HDL2 inhibitors. So the data is very, very compelling. It reduced the risk of new onset diabetes, so it's a diabetes prevention agent, by 25% in people with preserved ejection fraction heart failure or moderately reduced ejection fraction. So again, it reduced the new onset diabetes in all the 15 subgroups which are studied, including BMI, waist measurements, and glycemic status. So my final point is that people living with diabetes have a tenfold increase for progression to end-stage kidney disease than those without diabetes. Early stage CKD management is often missed. And if managed appropriately, progression can be slowed or halted. And therefore, do both EGFR and the USCR. The mineral corticoid receptor overactivation contributes to inflammation and fibrosis. And this is a potential tar target to slow the CKD progression. Despite of RAS blockade and HGL2 inhibitors, still there is a large residual risk of CKD progression. We should talk of CKD residual risk only in heart disease, but that's not true. There's a renal residual risk. And now we have an agent for that renal residual risk, which is finrenone. But it can be used universally. It can be used in 1, 2, 3, and 4 of CKD. It's a novel non-steroidal selectable MRA. It blocks the MR overactivation and is far different from the available steroidal MRAs. It has shown consistent CV data and kidney benefit data across spectrum of pre-diabetic, non-diabetic, diabetic, and CKD patients with all comorbidities and co-medications. Thank you so much for a patient hearing.